All right. Uh, good morning from Stanford University. Uh, my name is Will Chu. I'm the co-director of StorageX Initiative. It's a great pleasure to welcome everyone back after a bit of a um, um, break from our seminar series. And today I'm delighted to be hosting two of my um, academic colleagues to talk about the fundamentals of ionic transport. So let me just give a brief um, introduction to the topic and then I will uh, introduce our speakers. So ionic transport really underpins almost all of electrochemical technologies. Uh, and over the past 30 years, we have really seen a huge advent in the understanding uh, in materials for lithium ion batteries. However, um, as we think about um, the post-lithium ion battery world, um, many new materials need to be discovered and new mechanisms need to be understood. For example, um, many of you have heard talks uh, from our industry partners um, on solid state batteries. Um, and you've also heard talk about transport of ions beyond lithium uh, from other academic colleagues. So that is the theme of our seminar today is to really explore how um, we can better understand and therefore control ionic transport uh, in these materials. Uh, so we have um, two speakers. Um, we have Professor Wolfgang Zeyer from the University of Münster and also Professor Kimberly C from Caltech. Um, <clears throat> so Wolfgang um, is someone who has performed one of those magic tricks of transforming himself from one field to another and to another, um, which is really quite extraordinary. I had the pleasure of knowing him um, uh, for about 20 years, actually, uh, where he was initially studying uh, charge transport in thermoelectric materials. And uh, I think as history would have it, uh, he got excited about uh, ionic transport and mixed conduction in thermoelectrics while he was a uh, postdoc um, at Northwestern University. And then he made this really big leap of faith uh, to take some of the same concepts uh, for understanding heat transport and charge transport in thermoelectrics and transformed it to understand solid electrolyte uh, as they're used for solid state batteries. It's, it's quite rare to see people reinvent themselves so rigorously from really disconnected fields. Um, so that's why it is being so uh, exciting to see the latest progress uh, from Wolfgang's group uh, and Münster, where it's now a, a chaired professor. So Wolfgang, we're really excited to hear from you today on the, the latest with uh, phonons and ions and other things in solids. All yours. Thank you, Will, for the, for the kind introduction and, and, of course, the invitation. So we've known each other for 12 years, not 20. Um, I, I don't think we're that old, um, but I think. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I was, I was really happy about the invitation because usually I get asked to talk about solid state batteries and not too much about ionics. And I really want to put some of the, the thoughts that we've had um, over the past years and recently on ionic transport and really a little bit of the, the solid state chemical concepts there. But at the end, I decide I'll show a little bit on, on like uh, uh, transport limitations in, in solid state batteries as well, because I think we do need to make that jump from a local jumping iron to how it is moving in, in composites. Now, why do we do all of this? Well, um, the I think the motivation really is if we, if we go away from a liquid electrolyte to a device that has a solid electrolyte, Ideally, we can use a lithium metal anode. We can maybe make them smaller. We won't have polarization um, issues and uh, they might be safer. And so currently there's this push towards solidification. And what we really need there is when you have the liquid cell, you have a, you know, well, a liquid nicely percolating all active particles <clears throat> and wetting them nice. Um, and so ion transport is quite good. And once we're in solids, we have solid, solid contact, solid, solid interfaces, and things become a little bit more um, uh, difficult. We need a good percolation of the ions through an electrode. We need materials that are processable. <clears throat> we need decent electrolyte stability, and we need a high ionic conductivity. And for the longest time, I thought, well, high ionic conductivity just means that we don't want a large IR drop between our electrodes. Um, this is still the case, but we may need to think about 
which ionic conductivity are we talking about that needs to be high? And so what my group mostly does, I would say, is try to <clears throat> understand ion transport in materials and trying to push them. And here's, a, here's an overview of different materials classes on the left conductivities on the right activation barriers. And you can see in, for instance, the so-called Aguirre class, and I'll, I'll get to those in a minute, you have a large spread of ionic conductivities of orders of magnitudes within the same structural fan. And this tells us that there is a lot that we need to understand of how compositions and structure affect ion transport and how we may be able to push those. Now, what is ion transport? I think ion transport is a very simple conceptual process where an ion sits on a lattice site, jumps to an empty adjacent lattice site by that and it's displaced the lattice a little bit, all this costs energy and this gives you a delta G. And this delta G is, well, we sort of measure this as an enthalpy and activation barrier, it controls the overall ionic conductivity. And the structure itself determines your energy landscape. So let's say our lithium here is happy in a, tri a trifold coronation, but it's unhappy in a fourfold coronation. The final state will be higher in energy, which means even if we overcome the activation barrier for the lithium and sits on the saddle point, it's most likely to jump backwards than forwards. So coordination really matters. And if you go to, to textbooks, you see a, a list of things that seem to matter, such as number of available sites or defects. If there's no, if there's no space to jump in here, then the ion may is most likely not going to jump in some sort of dimensionality. Three-dimensional conductors are better than one-dimensional conductors. We need things of that uh, polyhedra of our mo mobile ion are, are well connected. And we can see that here schematically, let's say in HCP lattice, an ion sits on a tetrahedral site and wants to jump to an adjacent tetrahedral site, the space sharing. This doesn't cost a lot of energy, 0.2 EV. Why? Well, if you think of this as a chemical reaction, we don't have a change of reaction coordinate, but we can think of it like this. We change our coordination from four to three to four. This doesn't cost a lot of energy because we're just cleaving one bond and forming a new bond. This is a good jump path. But for long range transport, we would have to go by an octahedron to the next tetrahedron. We change our coordination from four to three to six. Lithium might be unhappy. So in a higher uh, intermediate state, activation barrier is higher. And this this is one of my favorite examples to show how the structural polyhedral arrangement alone of the mobile ion affects your energy landscape. Now, we do have a lot of influences or ideas how we can influence ion transport. One of them, and I think this is a typical one, is that we just try and synthetically blow up the unit cell by substituting the material, open up the fusion pathways, this displacement is not needed as much um, for the ion to jump. And we always believe that then the activation barrier decreases and the conductivity increases. And today I'm gonna to show something that challenges that this belief may be a bit too simplistic. Let's put it this way. Um, there's also concepts of softer, more polarizable lattice. I quickly touched this. I'm not gonna talk about phonons too much today. And in general, that strength of bonding interaction matters. And these are things I'll, I'll slightly touch on. Now, I split the talk in, in three parts. One is some of the work that we've been doing on understanding agaridites. And this is, I apologize if um, some people have seen parts of these slides before, but this is our workhorse where over the last, I would say, seven years, we've been trying to refine our understanding of how transport um, occurs. Then I'll talk about the uh, general usefulness of structural descriptors. And in the end, I'll, I'll show a bit on transport limitation in, in solid state batteries. Now, why, why agaridites? Well, the agaridites are a fun materials class to work with. And uh, lucky for us, I would say, um, they're also mostly used in solid state batteries these days because they're just really good ionic conductors. And they're also very easy to make. And they have, in principle, a simple crystal structure. So we have a, um, these agaridites are thiophosphates of PS4 um, uh, based materials and the general uh, unit uh, formula is Li6PS5X and X can be a halide, uh, is a halide, chloride, bromide, iodide, sits on, uh, forms an FCC, cent uh, FCC lattice of the halide and ions. And you can have these orthothiophosphate tetrahedra on the octahedral sites. And you can have half of the tetrahedral sites occupied by free sulfur S2 minus Ni. This gives us then our full formula and the lithium sits somewhere in that unit. 
the somewhere in the unit cell was for a long time believed to just be clusters of lithium that uh, sort of form around the free sulfur and iron. And you have fast rotation between these ions, uh, between these sites, uh, two lithium sites, and that the long range jump needs to sort of go from one cage to another. For a long time, we've wondered why this is the case. If you do some sort of topological analysis of these cages, they're very isolated. The distance between the cages is quite high. And you can, you can imagine that the longer the distance is, the more difficult it is for a jump to occur. Um, and so why are these so good ionic conductors? What we actually found is that there, there are actually more sites in there. For instance, there's one site that really connects these cages. And this tells us that for one, we need to understand the substructure, the lithium substructure more, and we need to use this as, 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 as tuning knobs for transport. Something that we found very early on is that there is a site disorder in these materials. So I said the sulfur sits here and lithium for, forms these cages around it, and here's a halide position. But in reality, when you make these materials, they disorder. A chloride anion has the same anionic radius than a sulfur anion. So just synthetically, you have some sulfur, some chlorine sitting here, some sulfur sitting here. And when you change the composition from chlorine to bromine to iodine, your halide becomes larger, this disorder decreases. And we were able to see back in 2017 that there's a, a strong dependency of the conductivity on the site disorder with an arbitrarily fit optimum in here. Um, but clearly this disorder seems to have an influence on the conductivity. And we can calculate the so-called bond valence, some maps, a fancy word for just saying how much space is for the lithium to diffuse. And if there's no disorder, you see that they pretty much just rotate around the cages. As soon as you turn on this order, you connect these cages. And we, we just wanted to understand why this is the case. So a little bit more structural work. Um, we sat down and decided, okay, let's really look at the lithium substructure of our um, of materials that we can perfectly control in terms of synthesis and stoichiometry. So we look at the iodide-based agaridite and take temperature-dependent neutron diffraction and just so, sort of show a radial histogram of, of the lithium distance. And they're very close together, and we only see two positions. As soon as we go to the bromide, there's more disorder. The cages expand. And we see an additional third position. So the disorder gives us a third position. And once we're in the chloride, where we have roughly 50, 50% disorder between the sulfur and the chlorine, the cage has expanded much more. This is remarkable because you can imagine your iodine is larger, which means your unit cell is larger. And then you go to bromine, the unit cell shrinks, you go to chlorine, the unit cell shrinks further, but the cages, the lithium ions expand more. And what we then decide is to say, well, let's, let's do some sort of metric that describes the spreading out of this cage. And this is an, an average um, distance, an average radial distance away from the center um, anion, which we call our mean to describe this, uh, this lithium substructure uh, spreading out. And if you plot this R mean versus the disorder, it increases. You can easily envision this in terms of uh, electrostatic interactions. If we only have sulfur sitting here, it's sulfur to minus, more electrostatic interactions, so the cage is smaller. You start putting a one minus an ion on it and the cages start to expand. And this is now what we actually try to use to tailor the lithium substructure. But before I get into that, let's talk about what this disorder actually is. Is it thermodynamics? Is it kinetics? So you can make these materials, this is a bromide, a gyridite. It's easier to distinguish bromide with x-ray diffraction. And we can make the material by a standard route of two weeks, just annealing, shutting off the furnace, and you get roughly 20, 22% site. You can also take the material from 550 degrees Celsius and just quickly quench it. You get a much higher disorder. So it seems that at higher temperatures, we have higher disorder. And by quenching, we kinetically sort of trap the site disorder. So thermodynamically, they want to be disordered at higher temperatures. If this is correct, then we should be able to do a slow cooling approach to lower the disorder. And if we slow cool over five days, and more my student didn't want to um, slowly adjust the furnace in the lab, um, we get to 13% uh, disorder. And the ionic conductivity scales with this disorder. If I plug this back into this initial graph, we really see, well, if we play with the disorder, we can tailor the conductivity. Why? Well, let's push this understanding further. 
instead of just quenching from 550, we now decide, okay, let's just quench it from different temperatures. Because if it's really thermodynamically and tropically driven that it wants to disorder higher temperatures, the temperature should matter. And what we do see is that the disorder increases with increasing annealing temperature. And when we look at nutrient diffraction data, the experimental data here, we see that this radial distribution of the lithium really expands with increasing disorder. And here down here plotted as an average charge on that structural site. And uh, ab initio molecular dynamic simulations sort of corroborate that. Um, we can pretty much see that in, in, in so-called maximum entropy maps from a neutron diffraction that the more disorder you have, the more these, these, your core density of lithium is really spread out. Um, AMD shows this, I'll quickly show this because this is a little bit more um, uh, visual where if you have 0% disorder, the lithium really just rotates in these cages. And as soon as you turn the disorder, they just fly fast through the unit cell and you get a very high ionic divisivity. And so we can either plot the ionic conductivity versus the site disorder, we can plot the ionic conductivity versus um, this, this radial distribution, this, this average distance of lithium away from the center. And so clearly disorder and the lithium distribution are affected by, are affecting each other. Maybe they're affecting each other, but um, at, at this point, I would say that this order affects the lithium distribution. And this is something that we can tailor synthetically. And we can use this descriptor to further by compositional changes, increase the ionic conductivity, because in the end, all you need to do is take out that additional sulfur and plug an anion in there that is more, that is, that is less charged. So uh, a halide in the end. This brought us back to something that we found 2018, knowing now that the disorder really affects the lithium distribution. Back in 2018, we, we started substituting the, uh, the, the iodide, the geridide with germanium. And what we saw is that there's the activation barrier at some point really drops. The more germanium you put in, the more lithium you put in. And it, it goes by on some sort of inflection point. We hadn't seen that before. And this seemed to correlate with some sort of onset of disordering. And back then, this was, I think, the, the fastest, fastest lithium conductor. And, and luckily, there's, there's more now out there. And it was such a good ionic conductor, we could actually make uh, well-loaded solid-state batteries with it. But we've never really understood why this, this actually became such a good ionic conductor. And so this is something that we looked at in the collaboration with Martin Wilkening at TU Graz um, via NMR. So what we're able to see is that um, when we increase the germane content, we start to turn on sulfur iodine site disorder. If this comes from the additional lithium, it's something we can, we can argue. But we do see that at some point, the disorder increases. By increasing the disorder, we see that suddenly we start to populate more crystallographic lithium sites. So there's one more, then there's another one coming in. And so you really see that from this topologically isolated clusters, we start connecting them, we start connecting them even further. Um, so the substitution turns on some sort of anion disorder. And by that, our lithium spreads out. And we can map this out again as this uh, average um, uh, radial distance. And this increases quite a lot, even more so than just the halides and the LI6PS5 uh, series. And by doing that, we pretty much move from these isolated clusters to very well connected lithium clusters, lowering the um, sort of flattening the landscape. And I think now we're at a point in the agaridites where I believe that we understand that we need anion disorder that creates charge immunogeneity in the system that leads to a very strong lithium distribution. And the better the lithium is distributed, um, the faster the ionic transport. Or the other way around, I guess the faster ionic transport, the more distributed it is when we do a diffraction. So I think at this point, um, I hope that we understand agiridides well. Um, that being said, I think two years ago, I would have told you that we know everything about this class of materials. Now I'm telling you that I think we know everything about it. And I hope in two years, um, I, I can make amends to that. Thing. Okay, um, this was some of the overview of, of the agiridides that, that we've been playing with. Um, I want to come back to my introduction to structural, static structural descriptors, so to say. So I mentioned that 
an ion that wants to jump from one side to another needs to overcome an activation barrier. And you can really think of this as well, the ion needs to displace the lattice a little bit, and there's evidence showing that. And so the typical approach is to increase the so-called structural bottom. Widening the unit cell lowers the activation barrier and gives you a higher, higher ionic transport. And I wonder if this is true. Well, let's see. We decided to use a, um, a model system to study this, a sodium ion conductor. It's in principle Na3PS4, so a sodium thiophosphate. For phosphorus, we can substitute antimony, and for sulfur, we can substitute selenium. So we can make, instead of a, a single series of substitutions, we can make a full, well, I call it a, a box or a box approach, where we go from the sulfide to the selenide in certain steps. We go from the uh, selenophosphate to the selenoantimonate. We can go from the thiophosphate to the thioantimonate and so on. Um, what we do know is that the, the, the two structural polymorphs that are so similar that for now, let's just assume that they're, that they're the same structure, but we, we do see a, a slight uh, change of structure along uh, a series, but the jump paths are quite similar. So I think um, the analysis that we're going to do um, is quite fair. So what do we see? And this is a lot of work of my student of um, uh, yeah, a, a lot of years and, and frustration, I guess, for him to figure out what are the structural descriptors, and now I'm telling you that there's none, um, but I'm, I'm trying to lead up to this. So what do we see? We see a typical behavior that if you substitute something, the unit cell changes. So on the left, cationic substitution, we're going from phosphorus to antimony in the sulfide in the selenides. The selenides have a larger unit cell and going from phosphorus to antimony and expands the unit cell, eight, nine percent. And the anionic substitution, going from sulfur to selenium, your unit cell expands more than in a cationic substitution. This is already cool to see. What we do see is that the unit cell volume correlates with an average ionic radius. And this is really just an arithmetic uh, an ionic, uh, ionic radius of all of the components that we have in the system. Remarkably well correlating, something that I wouldn't have expected, but um, we're happy with that. What else do we see? Well, usually we try to look at polyhedral volumes, how they're changing, because that's our structure bottleneck, right? So we can look at these um, diophosphate uh, or these, these polyhedra, polyanionic groups, and we see that in the cationic substitution, sulfide, selenide, by putting antimony on the phosphorus side, these polyhedra expand quite a lot, 40 to 50% of their volume um, increase. Um, if we do an anionic substitution, so replacing sulfur with selenium, it's like half of that. So the anion doesn't expand as much as a cationic substitution does. So locally, the, the type of substitution clearly seems to matter. Interestingly enough, when we do a cationic substitution, the sodium calcogenide polyhedron, it's an eightfold co uh, coordination, barely increases if we cationically substitute. If we anionically substitute, it increases by 10%. My gut feeling would tell me, hey, then the anionic substitution is the one that we need to use to increase the ionic transport. But the unit cell, uh, the, the, the MS4 polyhedra changed a lot more here, even though this, this polyhedron doesn't change. Why? We think that the reason is that it, we're just distorting more. So we know that if we go from phosphorus to antimony, this tetrahedron is expanding a lot. We know that the, this polyhedron does barely expand, but it seems to distort. There's an angle that we can describe. And just by this expansion, it just distorts more and the, the, the angle um, changes a lot, but not the, the volume. So from the PS4 to the SPS4, you see a large change in the angle and barely change in the volume. What's the take home message here? is that our typical belief of, let's just throw an element in there, which is expanding the unit cell, we're expanding all polyhedra, is not necessarily correct. Um, the type of substitution clearly matters locally, and this is something we could look at. And we probably would have never caught that had we not done this box approach, because what we would have seen is that irrespective of the substitution, hey, the bottleneck changes, our polyhedral volume increases but not as much as, as or really depending on, on the type. Now, let's find a descriptor for this bottleneck. 
there's two that we can use, and I'll show two. One is the sodium polyhedron, and one is a distance, uh, anion, anion distance that the sodium needs to jump through. Let's use this here for now. This also barely changes in the cationic sub substitution, it changes more in the anionic substitution. So let's choose this as a structural bottleneck for the ion jump from one polyhedron to the next one. So we can measure ionic transport of all of these materials. And the error bars, to some extent, are triplicates, not in the full series. Um, Someone would have ripped my head off, but to make sure that these trends are, are correct. We did that, and we can unfold this box, and you see a really cool trend of decreasing activation barriers depending on where you start. Um, but this only looks this nice because we're plotting it this way. Let's really look at these descriptors. Let's plot the activation barrier versus the anion anion distance that we have. And this is a beautiful linear trend. And this was a paper that we published in 2018 saying, oh, if you blow up the unit cell, you get better transport. Looks really great. But if you put this whole thing together, not so much anymore. What do we see here? We see that for a given bottleneck distance, we get two activation barriers. So the structural bottleneck cannot be a good descriptor for an activation barrier. We can also plot this for the, the sodium polyhedral volume, and we get a similar behavior. And I think this shows us that the bottleneck itself, or that this is the main contributor to transport, may not hold up in all materials. Had we only done a single substitution like we once did, we would have said that this is a dominant factor. But doing this two-dimensional substitution shows us that it's not. So what can it be? And something I will mention that, that we're trying to work on is figure out if there are dynamic influences on ion transports. So if you think of the ion sitting in a, uh, in, a uh, in, in an harmonic oscillator, it needs to jump over an activation barrier. And if we soften the lattice, so increase this, this, um, this, uh, this harmonic oscillator, we, we usually get higher ionic transport, lower activation barriers. And this is something you can find in literature and uh, pretty much just going from oxide to sulfides, going from chlorides to iodides, going from sulfides to selenides, higher anionic polarizability, soft to lattices, we increase the ionic conductivity. But it's becoming challenging to really measure this. And in the, in the past, we measured this via uh, speed of sound measurements to measure the bifrequencies or inelastic neutron scattering to get a uh, real look at how the phones are moving. And here I'm proposing two different descriptors that are at least on the lab scale easier to um, access. One, if we talk in these parabola, we can think of uh, thermal expansion. And what we can do is we can use these materials, measure thermal expansion, and from the thermal expansion coefficient and their heat capacity, we can define anharmonic bulk modulus. Um, and in the second approach, we can just look at the melting point. I said that the bonding situation, the overall bonding influence may matter. And so if we have a, a stiff, rigid lattice, we should have small displacement of the ions and high melting temperatures. And the soft lattice should have lower melting temperatures. And so of course we can measure the melting uh, temperatures of, of, of the materials. We can then look at how melting temperature and anharmonic bulk moduli um, actually correlate and they correlate quite well. So the lower your bulk modulus, the lower your melting temperature. So this sort of chemically makes sense. Let's see if they can be used as descriptors. We can plot the activation barrier via, versus the melting temperature, and we can plot the activation barrier via, versus the bulk modulus. And this seems to be a much better average descriptor in this class of materials to, uh, for, for the ionic transport. And so I think um, what, what I want to say is that Clearly, ion transport is more complicated than we currently think. It's not just structural. There's, there's, there can be a lot more factors at play. And we would have only found that out. Um, we wouldn't have found it out had we not done a two-dimensional substitution. But I can also tell you that we've done this on other compounds where you see a beautiful a trend of an activation barrier with a bottleneck. And so I think this is something that we need to do as as, as as annoying as it may be for a doctoral student um, to, to map all of these out, but this is something that we need to do to really understand transport in our uh, materials. All right, in my, my final few minutes that I have, well, and I'll, I'll try to hurry up. Um, um, I wanna talk about transport limitations in solid state batteries. And in this case, I'll talk about lithium sulfur solid state batteries. 
And what we always see is that these lithium sulfur, the source that batteries give us similar capacities as conventional um, cells, so with a liquid electrolyte, but usually a higher overpotential. And so this, this made us think about how transport actually happens in these composites. How does this work? Well, the transport that I've shown you so far is consolidated electrolytes and lithium just moves from one side to, to another. And this, these are easy transport metrics. In a solid state battery composite, things become tricky. They become more torturous. So let's say we put sulfur in here and suddenly the transport path is no longer direct, it's torturous. And we can then ascribe an effective ion transport that is a function of the volume fraction of our solid electrolyte, how torturous the pathway is, and the ionic conductivity that we went in with with the electrolyte. And in, in truth, in these lithium sulfur cells with carbon in there, so we have three phases. And if we're honest in solid state batteries, we have a fourth phase that is porosity. So the effective ionic conductivity will matter. And what we see is when we measure these, is that your ionic conductivity of your pure solid electrolyte, once you decrease the volume fraction of the solid electrolyte, so you put more active material in there, in this case, carbon and sulfur, the ionic conductivity decreases and the effective ionic conductivity decreases over orders of magnitude. If you're familiar with um, transport in, in liquid cells, this would be the Brueggemann model and we're dropping a lot more. So we're losing a lot of conductivity just by making our composites. And I believe that this drop in, in resistance, uh, this increase in resistance gives us this uh, large uh, polarization in, in our cell, this large overpotential. Um, pretty much schematically saying that the more tortured it is, the slower your ion transport is. And I think there's two ways that we can optimize um, ion transport. We need to think no longer just about ionic conductivity. Yes, one approach is to say, okay, we're currently at five to 10 milli Siemens per centimeter of an ionic conductor. If this drops by two orders of magnitudes, we probably need a hundred milli Siemens per centimeter for an ionic conductor to be good enough in thick uh, or high loading solid state batteries. Um, challenging work for us to do it, that, that work on these materials, but maybe we need to think about structuring, thinking about the composite microstructure and, and optimizing the microstructure to really get fast ionic transport. And then a final comment, um, something that, that I want to show another issue that we have with low effective ionic conductivities. So we can look at um, these batteries via neutron tomography and neutron radiography to really look at reaction fronts. And what we see is the following. So we have a cell in a beam that we're discharging. So we're converting sulfur from lithium sulf to lithium sulfide. And it's, uh, whatever you see now here in, in uh, bright white is sort of the lithium sulfur forming. So that it's the lithium that you see moving through cells. And we do that during the first uh, discharge as a function of depth of discharge. And what we see is here down the separator, up here is the current collector. That look at this video. But there's a reaction front moving from the separator to the current collector. You can see that here visually as, as, as attenuation that this is really growing from the separator up to the, um, to the current collector. So again, in the video, and we can plot this as a median rate of, of change of the attenuation. And you really see that at 0% depth of discharge, it's moving towards the current collector. This is a problem. This is a problem because that means that we have inhomogeneous reaction fronts in the solid state battery. It also means that when you run your cell and you think that all of the charges that you're the electrons that you're getting out is coming from the full composite it may just be at the separator so you may have local overcharging effects that uh, kill your electrolyte for instance at the separator but why is that the case well it's the effect of transport that is limiting so in, in this case um or in general if we had a composite where electronic and ionic transport was infinitely fast at every reaction point, we would have plenty of lithium and plenty of electrons. We would have a beautiful uniform current distribution and reaction. Now, in this case, we have slow effective transport. So the electronic transport is fast. We have a lot of carbon in there. Ion transport is slow. So the ions are supplied by the separator. There's enough ions close to the separator. So we have more of a reaction front here and it's slowly percolating upwards. If it was flipped and electronic transport was limiting, then your reaction front would start at a current collector, but you would still have that. So it's, it's not just that we need faster ionic conductors 
to um, get rid of over potentials and, and have thicker electrodes, but we also need fast ionic conductors to make sure that we don't see reaction forms and immunogenous um, reactions in our solid state batteries. And we need to balance our ionic and electronic transport because it's important that electrons and ions come to the reaction site at the same time. Otherwise, you'll always have these in, in homogeneity. And yeah, with that, I thank you for your attention. I hope I was able to convince you that, well, for one, lithium gear that's are fun to work with and that there's a lot of underlying structural questions still. Um, I hope I was able to show that structural descriptors may or may not be ideal. And I think that really depends on the system that, that one is looking at. And um, there's no uh, one, uh, one idea fits it all, one glove fits it all uh, to ionics. We really need to look at, at uh, independent materials. And I hope I was able to convince you that solid state batteries might be more tricky than we think uh, in terms of transport in a composite. And that's not just high ionic conductivities that we need, but we need them to be fast in a solid state battery composite. And with that, of course, um, I need to thank the funding, the collaborators in my group, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Wolfgang, thank you for that very exciting talk connecting so many different aspects together. Uh, so maybe I thought um, we can talk a little bit about, um, uh, oh, let's see, about the, the solid state chemistry of transport. So you talk about this uh, bottleneck, right, in terms of uh, a bond length. And uh, at least sort of in freshman chemistry, uh, we always think about the bond length also to be quite related to electronegativity in, in an ionic system. So are you also saying that maybe there's also intrinsic decoupling also with um, electronegativity or think that's another degree of freedom that is separate from the bond length and um, the, the softness of the lattice? I don't know if it's uh, an independent degree of freedom. I mean, they're, they're intrinsically related, right? If you have a, a, a lower charge or a, um, uh, a lower electronegativity, things are not as strongly bound. So we know the reason why sodium ion conduct sodium ions in the solid state are faster than lithium is because lithium is just way too sticky electrostatically. And we, we can then talk about electronegativity. There's this moving away from the sulfides to the halides because um, lithium is less stuck to a chloride anion than to a halide, uh, to, a, to a sulfide. They're all interrelated, I would say. And it's in my opinion, it's something that we need to look at in, in each individual system. What is the main contributor? Right. And there was also a related question from the audience on um, um, bond valence models. So ha have you guys looked at that as a potential descriptor or that it's used in very different contexts elsewhere? So uh, bond valence is um, in, in different contexts, you probably mean like that you can sort of figure out uh, oxidation states of, 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 uh, of, of ions in, in solids. Well, you can map out these geometric pathways, calculating this via, via bond valence sums. Um, it's, it's a good, I would say for us, this is always a good start. It gives nice pictures of, okay, what could be potential pathways, but it's, it's all static. Right, so in, in MD, at least your, your ions move. There's, there's more and more evidence that in, in the materials, when the ions are moving, that the anions are truly moving out of the way. This is something that you're not capturing uh, in, in BVS. So um, I think MD is, 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 is much stronger there. But whenever you look at um, look the structure itself and where lithium may be sitting, a calculated landscape via BVS may give you an indication if well, if that is a, a high energy site, um, it may really not be populated and this may be wrong. So it's, I think um, checking BVS against structural data is, is always a good start if, if your structural data makes sense. Um, everything in terms of structure should be taken with a grain of salt and BVS as well. Because in the end, in these fast kind of, we arbitrarily chop up our unit cell and say, oh, this could be a position. Right, um, but in these fast conductors, it's uh, lithium density is, is in many ways just spread out. Well, the next question is for me. Um, this is kind of a high-level question. Um, so 
you know, in the catalysis field, um, you know, we have seen the success of the descriptors work really well, especially um, when consistent computations are done to obtain those descriptors. But of course, in many systems, um, the descriptor is not single dimensional, it's sometimes multi-dimensional, which it makes it quite hard to understand. Um, so Wolfgang, I'm, I'm curious sort of your philosophy here is, do you think there is a sort of a single dimensional descriptor that could explain everything? Or do you think the reality is more complex and sort of as you have shown there, um, you know, something, um, you know, more than one um, descriptor is needed to represent the system? I think more than one descriptor is needed, but I think all of these descriptors are interrelated to some extent. I, like we said, bond length, polarizability, electronegativity, the structure clearly plays a role. Um, then the disorder, right? And this is if we have, um, if we just use a, a bond length descriptor, the, then you, you start putting a disorder in and you have charges all over the place. Um, the way, so defects, disordering of, of materials. Uh, there's a reason why if you ball mill things, they become better. Uh, because you just introduce a lot of ball mills in, in these harsh syntheses. Um, so a lot of things play a role, um, I would say. Yeah, I could it would be more. nice. <laughs> yeah, and it would be nice to do it like the catalysis field, but you need ideally high throughput studies, right, where you have a lot of data, but making these materials, consolidating them, sputtering, measuring impedance, then you have porosity. Are you sure that it's not also grain boundaries contributing? Right? Uh, uh, everything that we do might be faulted because we don't know anything about the grain boundaries of the sulfides because they're so soft that you can't see them in even at low temperature. Sometimes you, you can. Um. <laughs> I, I was going to ask both you and Kim that question later, but we'll, we'll save that question. for that. That's a much longer discussion. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I couldn't agree with you more often that um, the descriptors could be quite complex, uh, but I think what gives me a little bit of hope is that because everything is interrelated, there should be a higher level descriptor that in principle can tie things together, but maybe we don't fully understand it um, uh, quite yet. Um, there are two more uh, questions from the audience and let me just ask them really quickly. Um, so uh, in terms of your anion substitution, um, have you also looked at the change in the electronic conductivity, the partial electronic conductivity? Uh, in the anion substitution case, um, in in the from sulfur to selenide or Correct. in the chloride bromide iodide, um, yeah, oh, if you put a selenide in there, um, the color changes, um, and I, I think it, get, it becomes more gray. I think this this, this says enough. Um, so the, I I would assume the electronic conductivity increases. We haven't we haven't looked at it for a simple reason. Um, and this is also part of a much longer discussion. It's very difficult to measure electronic transport properties of these systems. What one currently does is two blocking electrodes and polarizing. But this is not a, uh, this is not how you should do it, right? You need in a head Wagner experiment, you need a non-blocking electrode and a blocking electrode, and then do your polarization. But none of these materials are stable against lithium or sodium. So we're running these experiments without fixing the chemical potential of lithium or sodium. Um, so whatever you get out as electronic conductivity is bound to be wrong. Um, yeah. Last question from the audience. Um, so related to this question of um, uh, interfaces and stability, so how does these substitutions that you talk about affect the electrochemical redox window? I presume based on what you said, this may be a challenging task as well. Yeah. So. Um, I think the, the thermodynamic window is fully determined by your decomposition pathways, right? Just Gibbs tells us wherever, um, or, or Hess law, whatever it decomposes into, we can just calculate that into a thermodynamic window, which means as long as there's a sulfur in there, the decomposition will create a sulfide, um, which means um, the electrochemical window in let's go from chloride to bromide to iodide will stay the same. Um, the selenide will change it. But as long as we're within the sulfur, uh, in, the, in, in the sulfides, I don't think we can increase the thermodynamic stability of these materials. We don't know anything about kinetic stability of these. I mean, we can, we see that kinetics, like the practically the stability changes, 
a little bit, um, depending on how you, you change the, um, uh, your electrolyte. But when you think about when, when things just decompose at an active material, then now whatever formed at that interface determines the pathways of, of decomposition. Right? Is it electronically conducting? Is it ion conducting? What are the phases? Like we're now in a multi-phase um, space. And um, even theoretically, there's barely anyone um, mapping this out, how sort of kinetic decomposition uh, windows um, show up once you start decomposing things. Um, so very challenging question. And I, I have a lot of thoughts on it, but I don't have any uh, idea how to uh, properly solve this right now. As you say, more experiment for your doctoral students to do. <laughs> That's true. So what Don't tell them. Thank you very much. And please sit tight. And then uh, now let me ask E um, to introduce uh, uh, Kim, our second speaker. And we'll come back for a panel discussion at the end of, uh, of the session. E. Well, thank you, Will. And thank you, Wolfgang, for the very nice talk. Uh, let me introduce uh, our second speaker, uh, Professor Kim C from Caltech. Uh, Kim received his, her PhD from UC Santa Barbara. After that, uh, she went on to do a postdoc at the uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. I think about 2017, she joined in the uh, Caltech faculty. <clears throat> she has been doing very interesting uh, research on uh, anion redox. Uh, I believe the, that's the topic uh, she's going to uh, uh, talk about today. Well, over the last few years, uh, Kim's uh, research has been recognized with uh, multiple uh, very prestigious awards, including Beckman Young Investigator Award, the Volkswagen BASF Science Award in Electrochemistry, uh, the PACA Fellowship for Science Engineering, and uh, most recently, uh, Office on Naval Research Young Investigator Award. Uh, with that, Kim, uh, I'll let you uh, take over. Great, thank you so much, Eve, for that kind introduction, and thanks for the invitation to talk here today. It's my pleasure to tell you about the work we've been doing in anion redox um, and alkali, alkali rich metal sulfides. Um, before I jump into the main topic, I just want to sort of broadly introduce what my group is interested in. Um, so to do that, I'm just going to throw up a schematic of a conventional lithium ion battery that contains a lithium intercalated graphite anode, a lithium metal oxide cathode that usually contains some amount of cobalt, and a um, solvent-based electrolyte like lithium hexafluoride phosphate in carbonate solvents. And so the goal of my group is really to get away from, from this type of chemistry uh, because of the limitations associated with lithium ion batteries. And so those limitations, I consider there to be three um, that we can try to address with the chemistry. Um, so the first is the cost. So of an EV battery, most of the cost is in the materials. And of the materials cost, most of that cost is in the active cathode material. So if we can actively change the chemistry in the cell, we can change the, the cost of the battery. Uh, the second is resources. Um, so some of the main components in the lithium ion battery aren't the most sustainable things we could think of to put in a widely spread technology. So lithium, for example, is geographically isolated in Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile. Um, at least the most accessible reserves are there. Um, it's also mined in Australia. And cobalt, which I mentioned is one of the main metals in the cathode, is um, found primarily in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's mined in a copper vein in the south part of that country. And there are several humanitarian issues associated with cobalt mining. So we'd like to get away from cobalt. And then finally, the last issue is capacity. So I would argue that lithium ion intercalation chemistry is reaching its theoretical limitations. Um, so here's a timeline of some of the canonical intercalation materials that have been developed since uh, 1976, since Sam Whittingham did um, lithium TIS2. And now we have uh, different kinds of materials that are similar to lithium cobalt oxide, which of course John Goodenough invented in 1980 and was commercialized in 1991, where we can substitute different metals onto the cobalt site like nickel and manganese to form these so-called NMC type materials. Um, and these NMC materials are our state-of-the-art um, cathode electrodes. And the benefit of the NMC materials is that we can reach near theoretical capacity. So the orange bars here are showing the experimental capacity that, that's reached in the lab. And then the open bar shows the theoretical, assuming we can remove and, and um, reintercalate all the available lithium in the structure. And so what you can see with NMC is that it's reaching um, that theoretical limit. 
And in general, there's um, an intercalation limit to this sort of paradigm of one electron per transition metal um, that we do when we have intercalation chemistry. So to go beyond these types of issues with lithium ion batteries, we try to think of new chemistries we can put in the cell that, that try to address these issues. And so our battery looks a little bit different. Um, we have things like, we're very interested in metal electrodes, we're interested in different kinds of electrolytes, and we're also inter interested in different types of cathodes. And so some of the projects in my group include working on um, different uh, working ions compared to lithium. So we're very interested in things like magnesium, zinc, and calcium. Um, and these divalent uh, cations are difficult to move in the solid state. So we have projects trying to understand fundamentally how do we understand the ionics of divalent ion conductors. Um, and if you're interested in that topic, because maybe you were um, listening to Wolfgang's talk earlier, um, gave a great talk on ionics, um, you can look up some of these papers from our group looking at divalent ionics and trying to understand how to move um, these, these divalent cations through solid state materials. We also have projects where we're very interested in metal interfaces. So if we move to these next generation um, cations, they're only energetically competitive if we use metal electrodes as the anodes. And so we have to understand how to do metal deposition and stripping, and we have to understand how to stabilize the interface of that metal electrode against electrolytes. And a lot of these metals are, are very reactive and form very stable oxides. And then lastly, which is what I'm gonna focus on today, we have projects that where we're interested in, in essentially removing cobalt from the cathode um, and generating electrodes with high energy densities. Um, and to do that, we're looking at reversible multi-electron redox. Um, and the point of this project is to try and bypass this intercalation limit um, that's set by one electron per transition metal. So the work I'll tell you about today is done by Andy Martinolich, who is my first postdoc, um, Steve Kim, Josh Stack, and Charlie Hansen. Um, and we recently had more team members join this effort, um, Ishan, Michelle, Xiao Tong, and Colin. Um, and so really uh, everything I'm going to talk about today is, is due to their, their heroic efforts in studying these multi-electron processes. So just to put multi-electron in perspective, I'll go back to this lithium cobalt oxide material that we all know and love in, in conventional cathode materials. So lithium cobalt oxide um, is a metal oxide, a, a layered metal oxide material. Um, and you can reversibly remove one or half of the lithium per cobalt because there's an irreversible phase transition that happens if you go past that. But theoretically, you could get all the lithium out of this material. And if you did that, you would um, pull one lithium out per cobalt, and that would give you one electron oxidation on, on the cobalt. Um, and if you were to intercalate one lithium per cobalt, you would have one electron reduction per cobalt. Um, so this, this sort of paradigm of one electron per transition metal allows us to operate in this regime where we're doing intercalation chemistry. And by that, I mean that as we intercalate the lithium, the structure doesn't really respond in any meaningful way. There's, there's small contractions and expansions, but um, the, the crystallographic symmetry is high, highly related to the pre-lithiated structure. So if we think about going beyond this paradigm, and we now start to put more lithium in the material than we have transition metal, and then that moves us into this so-called lithium rich regime where we can have higher capacities. So over here on the left, I have my um, lithium metal oxide sort of paradigm. And now I'm comparing that to these lithium rich structures where lithium is substituted for some of the transition metal in the metal layer. So in this case, one third of the metals have been substituted with lithium. And these phases are, are of the formula Li2MO3 and have been known for quite some time. Um, and these lithium rich metal oxide materials, you can now assume that I can deintercalate more than one mole equivalent of lithium per metal. And if I do that, um, then the question becomes where's the charge compensation? So, do I have multi electron oxidation on my metal, or can I invoke anion redox in these materials um, for the charge compensation mechanism? And this is really important understanding where those electrons are coming from because it's a, it's a way to uh, start to target issues of the multi electron redox, like reversibility and hysteresis. And the benefit of this multi-electron redox is that we can reach much higher capacities. So in lithium metal oxides, um, like lithium cobalt oxide, um, we have 3D metals, which are technologically more exciting than 4D metals. Um, but we're limited by one electron per metal, so our capacity is hovering around 300 million bars per gram. But with these multi-electron materials, even though with the metal oxides we have to go to 4D metals like ruthenium, um, we can still get higher capacities theoretically because of the two electron oxidation. And so that's why these types of, of, of chemistries are really exciting. So a lot of the field is focused on understanding multi-electron redox or anion redox in metal oxide electrodes. Um, and what we decided to do was switch to sulfides. The reason for that is that when you try to do anion redox in oxide materials, um, the oxide oxidation potential is very high in voltage or very low in energy. 
And so in many times, many, many times you get electrolyte decomposition um, in conjunction with anion redox if you're lucky or in lieu of anion redox if you're unlucky. And so this electrolyte decomposition um, really uh, convolutes the electrochemistry. So you don't really know where your electrons are coming from. So it's really hard to calculate capacities. Um, and it also convolutes the spectroscopic tools that we use to understand anion redox. So you can have um, oxygenated products as a function of electrolyte decomposition. So you don't really know what's happening with the oxide redox at all. If we move to sulfides, however, the sulfide P states are much higher in energy than the oxygen P states. And so we can get sulfide redox at much lower potentials compared to oxide redox. And so these sulfide redox potentials lie well within the electrolyte stability window. Um, we know that very well from different types of conversion chemistries. And so sulfide redox then offers us a way to understand anion redox from a fundamental point of view. It's not only fundamentally interesting, but it's also technologically interesting. And that's because when we go to lithium rich metal sulfides, we can now use um, 3D metals again. So for example, here's a phase Li2MS2. So um, in this case, the metal is iron. Um, and so Li2FES2 is a lithium rich metal sulfide material that contains highly abundant and easily obtainable iron. And so that makes it very interesting. Um, the other reason sulfides are a compelling choice to study for anion redox is because of the mechanism and the reversibility compared to the oxides. So here I'm comparing um, Li2FES2 um, versus Li2RuO3. And so this is data out of our lab, but these materials have been studied for quite some time. So Li2RuO3 was first studied, of course, by John Goodenough in the 80s. And then Li2FES2 has been studied by people like Jeff Don, Ruchel, um, Emma Kendrick, for example, also since the 80s. But Comparing these two apples to apples um, has, uh, brings up some striking differences between the mechanism. And so the one that I'll point out initially is this um, difference between the cycle one and the cycle two charge curves. So both of these materials are getting over one electron out of the formula unit, meaning that we're deintercalating more than one lithium out of these materials. And in fact, we're deintercalating a lot more than one electron. It's 1.75 electrons. So we're getting 1.75 moles of lithium out of the material. That's a lot of material to deintercalate. Um, and if you look at this and compare Li2RuO3 to Li2FES2, um, what you'll see is that the charge curve for Li2FES2 for cycle one and cycle two are nearly identical. There's a slight capacity fade, um, but the mechanism for the, the charge compensation mechanism is largely maintained, even though we're pulling 1.75 electrons out of this material and we can get about 1.75 back in. With Li2RuO3, however, if you look between cycle one and cycle two, there's drastic changes in the shape of the curve and the voltage of the curve. Um, so that's telling us that whatever processes are happening on cycle one are causing irreversible changes to this material, um, and, and that's likely um, associated with these degradation mechanisms. So this reversibility of this sulfide material is also another compelling reason that we should study these sulfides for anion and redox. So what we wanted to do was understand the charge compensation mechanism of Li2FES2. Um, so there are some uh, characteristic regions in the charge curve. There's a sloping profile up about to a half an electron. And there's a plateau region where we get another electron out of the material in the charge curve. And then on the discharge, we kind of have another plateau and another sloping region. So we wanted to understand where these electrons are coming from. And if we indeed have multi-electron um, oxidation that is due to charge compensation by the anion. Um, so we turned to X-ray absorption spectroscopy to study uh, the electronic structure of the material. Um, so this is the iron and the sulfur K edge of Li2FES2. Um, and iron in this material is tetrahedral. Um, so it's a split site, lithium iron, 50-50% occupied site. Um, and it's edge sharing within this metal layer. And then you have this octahedral lithium layer, which is also edge sharing um, that separates the metal layers. So in the iron K edge, you can see this pre-edge feature here. Um, this pre-edge is associated with a slight distortion in the tetrahedral iron. So that you can see this iron is displaced off of center from the tetrahedron. And that gives rise to this pre-edge feature. Um, and then we have this uh, the rising iron K edge here that tells us about the oxidation state of the metal. And we can look at the first derivative of the rising K edge to give us a better idea of where that oxidation state um, or where that uh, rising edge sits. And then we have the sulfur K edge spectrum, which is shown down here. Um, the sulfur K edge spectrum has this really beautiful pre edge feature. Um, this pre edge feature is the sulfur 1S to iron 3D transition that arises due to the covalent iron sulfur linkages within this material. Um, and then we have the, the sulfur edge here. So now that you're sort of benchmarked into the X-ray absorption, we can now oxidize this material and see what happens to the iron and the sulfur K edges. So as I oxidize the material, what I see in the iron edge is that this 
pre-edge feature actually increases in intensity, which is telling us that we have a more of a tetrahedral or more of a less distorted tetrahedral iron center. Um, and what we also see is that the rising edge shifts to higher energy. So this is suggesting that iron is oxidized in this initial region where we are doing the, um, the sloping region here from one to about half an electron. So initially we have iron oxidation of iron two to mix iron two, three, because we're only getting half an electron out. If we look at the sulfur K edge, um, the biggest difference here is a rise or an increase in intensity of this pre-edge feature. And so an increase in intensity of the pre-edge feature is tightly, is, is tightly correlated to the covalency um, of the material. Um, and this is work that has been done by Ed Solomon, for example, looking at um, iron-based proteins. Um, and there's been a lot of work uh, proving that the, the pre-edge feature here is associated with the covalency. And so this makes a lot of sense because as we oxidize iron two to iron two, three, we get an increase in covalency of the iron sulfur bond. So um, that makes a lot of sense. So this initial oxidation is really localized on the iron. So what happens then if we go to the plateau region and we take another full electron out of this material? So now I'm showing that in red. And so we see that the iron K edge, we still have tetrahedral iron as indicated by this pre-edge feature. And what's very interesting is that even though we're taking a full electron out of this material, the iron is not oxidizing. So the position of the iron rising edge stays essentially the same as it did at this 2.5 volt um, uh, point. However, if we look at the sulfur K edge, we see huge differences in the spectroscopy. So we see the evolution of this new pre-edge feature. Um, and we also see a big shift in the sulfur K edge. And so this is suggesting that sulfur is indeed oxidizing. And we can look to some standards to understand why there's a new pre-edge feature um, that, that grows in as the, as the material is charged. And of course, the material that we want to look at um, in great detail is FBS2, which has um, sulfur sulfur dumbbells. So here I'm showing pyrite FBS2, that structure. And you can see that all of the sulfurs in this material have sulfur sulfur dumbbells, are persulfides. And if you look at the pre edge feature in FBS2, you can see it lines up um, nearly identically to what we measure in the oxidized Li2 FBS2. And so this is suggesting that we have oxidation of sulfide to persulfide. Um, but I'll note that this um, initial pre edge feature is maintained. So we still have sulfide character in this material. And so we have a mixed sulfide per sulfide material um, after this oxidation has completed. And that makes a lot of sense because initially we take half an electron out. So we get mixed iron two, iron two, three, but this full electron that's essentially coming from sulfur, um, we believe um, is, is really localized on, on the S2 minus. If we were able to reduce all of the sulfur in this material, then we could get uh, more than one electron. So it makes sense that some of our sulfurs um, maintain uh, sulfide character as we do the oxidation. So we can then discharge the material to see if these oxidations are reversible. And indeed what we see is that the iron edge shifts back to its original position and the sulfur K edge also shifts back to its original position. And I'll note there are some wiggles out here that have changed. Um, and this is due to some irreversible structure changes that occur in the material. Um, but electronically, the oxidation and the reduction are very reversible. So we can think about how the structure is responding to this oxidation. And you might expect that it's responding quite significantly because we're pulling a lot of electrons out of the material and we're pulling a lot of lithium out of the material. And so we did operando x-ray diffraction to look at the, the structure response. And here I'm just going to focus on the 001 reflection um, of the Li2 FBS2. And what we see in the sloping region is that we get a solid solution-like behavior where the peak is simply shifting as a function of oxidation. But in the plateau region, we see the evolution of a new peak in the X-ray diffraction suggesting a, a two-phase type mechanism, which makes a lot of sense considering we have this really flat plateau in the charge curve. What you'll also notice is that the intensity of the reflection is decreasing. And that's because we're losing a lot of the long range order in this material. And one of the only reflections that we maintain significant intensity for is the 001. So we maintain some um, registry within the, within the C-axis. Um, but other than that, we've broken a lot of the symmetry within this material, which has caused all of our reflections to decrease in intensity. When we reduce the material, you can see that the uh, lattice uh, 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 contracts back, or sorry, expands back to its original position. Um, but we do not get back the crystallinity that we had before. So the intensities are still low. Um, so even though we're able to do that reduction, and actually the columbic efficiencies are quite good, um, the, the structure is not able to return back to its original um, to its original phase exactly. And if we look at the electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, here I'm showing um, some representative Nyquist plots um, along the charge and discharge curve. And then here I'm plotting the, the charge transfer resistance as a function of oxidation and reduction. And what we see is that as the material is charged, the impedance increases as a function of charge. 
And then it starts to decrease as a function of discharge, but it doesn't quite get back to its original position. Um, and that's because we don't have exactly the same material that we started with. And so this can lead to some capacity fade in the material. But now that we understand something about the structure as a function of oxidation, we can at least say in this sloping region where we have this solid solution-like behavior um, that the structure, the pristine structure and the structure at two and a half volts are, are pretty similar. And so that allows us to do some density of states calculations. And so we collaborated with Anton van der Ven and his student Farnas to do partial density of states calculations on both Li2 FES2 and then the partially oxidized Li1.5 FES2. And so if we look at the pristine phase over here on the left, um, we see that the, the, at, near the Fermi level, um, there is a majority of iron D states. And so this makes a lot of sense. And this correlates really well with our X-ray absorption that we initially see in iron. We initially see iron oxidation when we charge this material. However, after you delithiate lithium from this material, you see a rehybridization of the iron D and the sulfur P states to give us a more covalent iron sulfur bond. Um, and you can actually see that in the electron density map shown here. And what this does is it essentially pushes up the sulfur P states closer to the Fermi level. And this is now what allows us to access the sulfur P states and start doing anion redox in this material in lieu of iron redox. So if we're doing anion redox and we're going from sulfide to persulfide, um, and we see structural changes in the X-ray diffraction, um, where exactly are those persulfide bonds? Um, and this is actually still an outstanding question, but we can start to look at this by understanding how the iron changes as a function of oxidation. And so we have a good local structural probe for the iron local structure with the iron XFs data. And so here I'm just showing the first shell correlation. So the first shell, remember, is just this tetrahedral iron where we have iron sulfur bonds. Um, and we're looking at the bond length for those iron sulfur bonds and the coordination number as a function of oxidation and reduction. So we fit the XFs and we can then pull out these two parameters in the first coordination shell. Um, and what we can see is that here's the charge curve. Here's the discharge curve, and I've plotted um, the bond length and the coordination number on top of the charge and discharge curves. So initially for this charge, we see a decrease in the iron sulfur bond length because we have this more covalent iron sulfur bond. We've oxidized iron. That makes a lot of sense. But what's really surprising is that when we do this sulfide to persulfide um, oxidation in the plateau, we don't really see any change in the iron local structure. So both the bond length and the coordination number are relatively similar. Even though we have this huge structural transformation, we have a two-phase region in our diffraction, and we start to lose registry um, in the material, we really don't see a change in the iron local structure. And when we discharge the material, you can see that the, the bond length and the coordination numbers somewhat recover to their original positions. And so we have a hypothesis for how we might be able to form sulfur-sulfur bonds and not change the iron local structure very much. Um, so initially, we believe that lithium is deintercalated from the tetrahedral sites, and this is from calculations from Anton's group that has shown that the tetrahedral sites are more favorable. Um, once you form tetrahedral vacancies, you've now gone from edge sharing tetrahedra to corner sharing tetrahedra, and we think that these corner sharing tetrahedra can now tilt towards each other to form a sulfur-sulfur bond um, at the apex. And so forming these sulfur-sulfur bonds just requires a simple corrugation of the metal layer, which will um, break a lot of the symmetry in the material, but maintain some of the registry in the C-axis and also maintain the iron local structure as a function of oxidation. So just to summarize what happens with this material, um, initially you have uh, one or half an electron oxidation. That half electron oxidation can really be thought of as a topotactic inter deintercalation reaction where we have oxidation of iron two to mix iron two three. Um, and that's just shown in this cartoon here where we're just simply removing lithium. Further oxidation um, occurs on the sulfide. So this next one electron is some coming from sulfide and it's a sulfide to persulfide transition. And that sulfide to persulfide transition causes a lot of structural distortions in the material and we think could corrugate um, the metal layers to form those sulfur sulfur bonds. And so this first part is kind of an intercalation type reaction. And then this next part is starting to look like the conversion reactions where we have actually um, a lot of atoms moving and we have bond breaking and bond forming reactions occurring um, during that second oxidation. So now that we have a material that has that shows anion redox, we can use this material to start to understand um, structure property relationships. Um, the first structure property relationship we wanted to get at was the role of covalency in the anion redox. Um, so covalency has been touted in the oxide anion redox literature as an enabling tool to enable anion redox in the oxides. And this is um, a list of some papers that talk about covalency in the metal oxide materials. Um, as, as sort of a, an, as, as, as the thing they need in order to get um, the oxide redox to occur. Um, and this is non-exhaustive. These are just some that I pulled from the literature. 
And so we can use our metal sulfide materials to systematically change the covalency and determine how that might affect the anion redox behavior. And so you can imagine doing that one of two ways. You can either change the metal or you can change the anion. Um, and Wolfgang talked a little bit about this in the different contexts. And so what we ended up doing was changing the anion. Um, so what we did was we took our Li2FeS2 N member and we made Li2FeSe2, um, which is a selenide M member. And it turns out these two materials are isostructural, um, which is not that surprising. Selenides and sulfides are very often isostructural. But what that allows us to do is go from sulfur piece P um, states in the material to selenide to selenium P states. And the selenium P states are much higher in energy than the sulfur P states. And so we should get greater orbital overlap of the iron D and the selenium P states and get a more covalent material as we go to the selenide. And so the, the other advantage here is that these two materials are isostructural. And so we can actually make the solid solution in between. So we can do a systematic substitution of selenium for sulfur. Um, and just depending on our input stoichiometry, have some um, statistical distribution of those two anions on the anion sublattice. And so that's what we did. Um, so here I'm showing the X-ray diffraction for the solid solution, all the way from the sulfide end member to the selenide end member. And we can fit these X-ray diffraction patterns with our quantitative Rietveld refinement and pull out the lattice parameters. And if we plot the lattice parameters as a function of stoichiometry, we see that there's a linear correlation, which tells us that we have a statistical distribution of sulfur and selenium on the anion sites as we do the substitution. So we have a salt, an anionic salt solution. So then when we do the electrochemistry, we can see how this um, systematic change in the covalency going from sulfide to selenide affects the electrochemistry. And we see something that's very cool. So as we go from sulfide, which is shown in red, um, to selenide, you see a systematic shift in the anion redox potential. So the anion redox potential shifts to lower and lower voltages as you go to the selenide. And so we can actually plot this as a function of stoichiometry. So the position of the anion redox plateau versus stoichiometry, and we see a near linear correlation. And so what this is saying is that this material is very well electronically mixed. So as we oxidize, we're pulling electrons out of bands that have selenium and sulfur character, and they have rehybridized together to form a single band. So we're not just doing um, sel selenide oxidation followed by sulfide oxidation. It really is um, oxidation of, of both of those P states due to this, this rehybridization and the, and the good mixing of the two anions. And you might expect that this shift might have something to do with kinetics, because um, as we were sort of talking about earlier, uh, the selenides, of course, will likely have a higher electronic conductivity than the sulfides, which could lead to lower um, over potentials when we do the oxidation. Um, so what we did was um, galvanostatic intermittent titration technique, where we can measure the near equilibrium voltage of the oxidation, uh, oxidation processes by letting the cell rest um, in intermittent times as we do the oxidation. And so that's what's shown in this solid line. And so what you can think of it for the bottom of these polarizations, the bottom of these polarizations essentially tells us the thermodynamic potential of the oxidation. And so here I've drawn a dashed line that shows um, the average uh, voltage for the anion redox oxidation voltage um, for the Li2 FeS2. And so as we start to put selenium in the material, you can see that that um, uh, thermodynamic oxidation potential starts to decrease um, systematically. So as we put selenium in, you can see it drops here by about 100 millivolts. And then as we go to the selenide M member, we've now dropped that potential by over 250 millivolts um, just by putting selenium in the phase. And that's because of the change in the selenium P states compared to the sulfur P states. Um, and we still have anion redox in this material. And one thing we wanted to understand was if we have formation of selenium selenium bonds, just like we saw sulfur sulfur bonds in the uh, Li2 FeS2. So, one of the benefits of Li2 FeS2 is that we can get better Raman scattering from Li2 FeS2 than we could from the sulfide. Um, so, that allows us to use Raman scattering to understand if we have selenium selenium bonds. Um, so we can compare Li2 FeSe2 as we oxidize it um, to marcosite FeSe2, um, which has these selenium selenium bonds in the structure. And the selenium selenium stretches in FeSe2 are found around 217 wave numbers. So if we oxidize this material and do in situ Raman spectroscopy, um, what we see is a mode that grows in as we do the oxidation right around where we would expect the selenium selenium bond um, mode to, to be if we had selenium selenium bonds as a function of oxidation. And so we think that the Li2 FeSe2 also forms selenium, selenium bonds, just like the Li2 FeS2 forms sulfur sulfur bonds. So now we can move forward and try to understand how the charge compensation mechanism has shifted um, as, we, as we change the covalency in this material. And so we turn again to X-ray absorption spectroscopy. 
But instead of showing you all of the X-ray absorption spectra, um, I've simplified them to just looking at a shift in the pre-edge um, as a function of oxidation and reduction. So just to sort of orient you, we're first going to start with Li2FeS2 here on the top. And so here I'm just plotting the shift of the iron rising edge and the shift of the sulfur rising edge as a function of oxidation. So the electrochemistry is shown in black and reduction. And so what we see and what we already know is that as in the sloping region for Li2FeS2, um, we have first oxidation of iron as indicated by the shift in the iron edge. And then subsequently the iron edge does not shift but the sulfur edge shifts quite a bit. And so this is our sulfide to persulfide transition. And then both edges shift back as we do the reduction. So now we can compare what happens with Li2FeSe2. Um, so here is the selenide, where now we've shifted the P states closer to the D states, and we have a more covalent metal anion bond. Um, and what you can see is that throughout the charge curve, both the iron and the selenium are contributing to the oxidation. Um, and this makes a lot of sense. So if we have a more covalent material, we're actually going to push the anion redox away from the anion back onto the metal, because we have better mixing of the iron and the selenium electrons. Um, and then when we do the reduction, you can see that they, they shift back to their original position. And what's very cool is that if we look at the mixed material where we have 50% sulfide and 50% selenide, um, you see that all three are contributing throughout the charge curve. So we see shifts in the sulfur edge throughout, we see shifts in the selenium edge throughout, and we see shifts in the iron edge throughout. So this increase in covalency has basically pulled sulfur back into the charge compensation mechanism at earlier states of charge. And it's pulled iron into the charge compensation mechanism at higher states of charge um, because we have this more covalent material. Uh, and then we can do the reduction. You can see that they both, they all shift back to their original positions. So an increase in covalency in this case actually causes the charge compensation to shift back onto the metal compared to this sort of more discrete iron oxidation and sulfide oxidation that we have in Li2FeS2. So we thought that was um, a really nice sort of proof of concept to show that we're tuning the covalency. Um, and what we find with the cycling stability is that you might expect that maybe this material is more stable because you have this more covalent metal anion bond. Maybe it's able to stabilize these oxidative um, structures in a, in a better way. But actually what we find is the exact opposite. So if we look at the end member, the sulfide, um, the charge, uh, the, the cycling data as a function of cycle number is shown in red. And then as we put selenium into the structure, you can see that the charge capacity retention basically tanks. Um, where here's the selenide material, um, here's the end member, where uh, it, it loses capacity very quickly. And so this capacity loss we think is actually due to the structural response to the anion oxidation. So even though these materials are accommodating about the same number of electrons per, per formula unit, um, the charge compensation mechanisms are actually quite different, not electronically, but structurally. So if we look at the operando x-ray diffraction of the Li2FeSe2, um, we see something very, very different compared to what we saw with the Li2FeS2. So we get a two-phase region much earlier in the charge curve. Um, so we see the formation of that new phase. And I think that's because we're actually involving the anions earlier in the charge compensation mechanism because we've made a more covalent metal anion bond. And what happens then is that um, these two-phase uh, mechanisms are, are less reversible than these solid solution type mechanisms. And you can also see that in the impedance. Um, so this is the impedance spectroscopy here, representative Nyquist plots. And now I'm showing um, the charge transfer resistance as a function of oxidation for the Li2FeSe2. Um, and here you can see that the impedance increases as a function of charge, but it does not recover like the Li2FeS2 does. You can see that it maintains high impedance um, even though we're reducing the material. And so this is also likely a reason why the charge, uh, why the capacity fades as a function of cycle number. So just to kind of summarize this part of the talk, um, we've been able to show that we can um, do anion redox in Li2FeS2. We can tune the covalency by making anion salt solutions by um, moving from sulfide to selenide and, and shifting the selenium P states up closer to the iron D states. Um, and that allows us to systematically tune the potential of the anion redox, um, which is a very useful thing to do. Um, and it also allows us to have a handle on covalency and understand how covalency might affect the re reversibility of the anion redox processes. And so in the last part of my talk, I just want to put this into context in sort of a broader picture and understanding how um, pushing and pulling charge compensation from the anion back onto the metal might affect um, the mechanism of charge compensation, especially from a structural point of view and also the reversibility. 
So to do that, um, here on the top, I just have a sliding scale of the number of electrons that are being um, donated by the anion. So how much is sulfur playing into the charge compensation? So on one extreme end of the spectrum, we have you know, zero to small amount of electrons um, associated with the anion. So this is where charge compensation is mostly contributed by the transition level. So this, these are mechanisms that we all know and love. So this is just intercalation chemistry, right? So if we have things like LITIS2 and we deintercalate LITIS2, um, we end up with TIS2 and lithium. And most of that charge compensation occurs on the titanium. However, um, some, of that, some of that charge compensation can be pushed onto the anion. So if you look at the beta charge analysis, you'll actually see that that number is not equal to zero. Um, it's some fraction of an electron. So maybe there's some regime in here where we can maintain the structural integrity of the material and do this topotactic deintercalation intercalation reaction, but still utilize some of the electronic um, states donated by the anion. And so this is really this intercalation type mechanism where you have reversible structural changes, but minimal contribution from the anion. So we can look at the other end of the spectrum um, where we have a large contribution from the anion, where all of the, only the anion is participating in charge compensation. And of course, this is conversion chemistry. So this is doing something like uh, sulfur to lithium sulfide or lithium sulfide to sulfide. I'm sorry, lithium sulfide to sulfur. And so in this case, um, of course, the anion is doing all the charge compensation and there's a massive structural rearrangement. We have to go from sulfides to these S8 rings. And so there's a huge change in the phase. Um, the initial phase looks nothing like the beginning phase and that causes some issues associated with reversibility. And of course, there's, there's a lot of um, interesting mechanisms that occur, especially in this chemistry, depending on the electrolyte, because there are soluble intermediates, but I won't go into that right now. Um, we can just think about the solid state structural transformations and understand that the anions have to change positions quite significantly in order to get from uh, an S8 type structure to a, a rock salt lithium sulfide. And so the more charge compensation we push onto the anion, it looks like we have more structural changes, right? But now we sort of have this intermediate regime, this sort of hybrid mechanism where we can do both um, intercalation chemistry, um, but also have some structural rearrangements to accommodate this new bond that has to break and form as a function of anion oxidation. So this is sort of a hybrid mechanism that lies somewhere in the middle. Um, and, and in this mechanism, we can have some charge compensation by the sulfur where we're going from sulfide to persulfide, but it's reversible and we can go back to the sulfide. And we maintain some registry in the material um, to allow us to get a higher degree of reversibility. So the anions aren't moving quite as much in conversion, but they're definitely moving more than they did in, in intercalation because there's new bond breaking and forming reactions. And so I think the question now is um, how reversible is this sort of hybrid type mechanism and how far along the sliding scale can we push it until we start to run into the reversibility issues of conversion chemistry? Um, and we just submitted a perspective on this. Uh, so hopefully that will be out soon. And so I have to thank everybody that worked on this. Um, I thank the students and postdocs at the beginning of my talk, but I have a, a wonderful group of, of, of people that work with me and I wouldn't be able to do any of this, of course, without them. This is all of their hard work. Um, this is work that was done in our EFRC scalar. Um, so we have several collaborators um, that we've worked with to, to get this done at UCSB, Slack, UCLA, and USC. And I've highlighted them here. Um, in these green boxes. So, so many thanks to them. And also thanks to our other um, funding sources. And thank you again for the invitation to be here today. Uh, Kim, thank you for the very nice uh, fundamental study uh, works, uh, the talk. Um, there are a number of questions uh, flowing in. Um, so the first one is about the voltage hysteresis uh, and the lithium ion sulfide back and forth uh, and the charge discharge curve. What's the origin of that uh, voltage hysteresis? Is it uh, related to ion migration? Um, when you have sulfur sulfur bond formation forming the dimer. So what, what's the nature of that? I mean, hysteresis has a little bit, not, not too big though, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the iron actually maintains its tetrahedral geometry throughout the charge and the discharge curve. And we see that um, through the XFs and also through the X-ray absorption. So that sort of initial pre-edge feature tells us about that tetrahedral coordination. So it's not migrating to an octahedral site like you might expect if you were forming something that looks like pyrite. It's definitely not doing that. Um, but what we do see is that, uh, so 
Okay, so the iron doesn't migrate. But that hysteresis we think is actually associated with the breaking and forming of these sulfur-sulfur bonds and how kinetically accessible that is, either on oxidation or reduction. Um, and we have some work going on now to try to understand the charge compensation mechanism on the reduction, um, which will tell us more about the hysteresis. But what you can think, so simply speaking, the hysteresis is a path hysteresis. So the charge mechanism is different than the discharge mechanism. And we think that's because initially you start with a sulfide and you end up with a persulfide. So that, that difference in making that bond versus breaking that bond is what's causing, causing the hysteresis in the charge and discharge curves. Okay. So, so Will, you also have a question? Yes. Uh, wonderful talk, Kim. I was looking at your um, Li2Fe S2 result, and the, the mechanism reminds me a lot of the, uh, the vanadial um, phosphate system. Um, is, is, is this a sort of a, a comparable thinking as well, just due to the corner sharing nature and the flexibility to dimerize reversibly? I think it's probably similar. Um, I, think, I, I think for us, I think the driving force is making that sulfur-sulfur bond. Um, and that's probably very similar in the vanadials. So, but uh, yeah, that's an interesting point. I haven't thought to correlate those two before. Um, but certainly the, the generation of vacancies facilitates the structural distortions that we need in order to access the anion redox, right? So like without the vacancies, we can't form the sulfur sulfur bond. <laughs> so so that, that's a really key factor. Um, and that's, that's also true, true in the, the corner sharing materials you're talking about too. Yeah very, yeah, very interesting. And another related thing I've been sort of, you know, one of these intuitive guiding rules in layer oxides is that the, um, you know, the edge sharing is what really keeps um, the layer sliding from happening. Um, is, do you think that's what's happening in your XRD where you see after the first um, cycle and it really sort of amorphizes? Is it because of layer sliding or is it something else? I think there's definitely some layer slide, like there's some stacking faults because you know, if we think about the degree of deintergulation too, you know, it's one, you, we can actually, we can get 1.85 electrons out of this thing um, if we try hard at making our electrodes. Um, so we're taking out most of the lithium. <laughs> so there's really no reason for those layers to maintain any kind of registry between each other. Yeah, so the, I think there's lots of stacking faults. And we see this in other materials as well, um, like the Li2TIS3 family, for example, where you have um, octahedral metals. We see stacking faults in those materials when you do the oxidation. Do you think it's a trade-off? So you have more flexibility to dimerize the sulfur from the corner sharing but you have a little bit less um, of cohesive uh, energy to retain the layer structure compared to the edge sharing. Is that, is that a sort of a rule that you're seeing here? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good take home message. And I think that's going to be true probably of any of these alkali rich type chemistries where you know, you're really, you're breaking down the, the framework of the material by deintercalating it. So it's, it's sort of a miracle if you think of like LITIS2 that you can get to TIS2, that you can pull all the lithium out. But now we're going further than that, right? Like we're, <laughs> we're pulling lithium out of the metal layers too, if you want to correlate it to that, right? So it's not isostructural to Li2FES2, but um, you can think about it that way. So yeah, I think that's a, uh, once you start doing that, um, it's, it's, it's going to be difficult. But actually, I think there might be a way, and this is something that we're trying to study now, of using the, these new bond forming reactions to stabilize the structure. So, so you know, if you just had conventional deintercalation chemistry where there's no bond breaking and bond forming reactions per se with the metal and the anions, then you're sort of stuck and you just kind of have this open framework now and your layers can slip and all of these things can happen. And you know, there's a lot of changes between like an O3 structure and an O1 structure. So, uh, but if you have these bond breaking and forming reactions, maybe you can actually leverage those to stabilize those transitions so that you can control it in a better way. So you, like you glue it together with these persulfides and then you unglue it when you reduce it. Maybe that's something we can leverage. I, we're not there yet, but that would be very interesting. Looking forward to hearing more. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, thank you, Will. Um, so Kim, um, you know, moving uh, from uh, oxide system to sulfide system, of course, sulfide is uh, heavier. Um, 
So you you show very nicely and the effect sulfide adding selenide, uh, selenium right there, right to tune the voltage. So it's still a thought of uh, going the other way instead of adding uh, selenium, adding oxygen. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I also it's very different from, of, of course, from sulfur. So what's the challenge, uh, challenge in doing that, right? So then you can shift the voltage higher. It's actually better give you higher voltage, give you more energy. So what, what's the thinking of adding oxygen? Yeah, so we have um, several people in my lab who are now trying to shift the voltage in the correct direction, which would be up. <laughs> um, we, and one of our thoughts is to use oxysulfides. But as you mentioned, um, making oxy, you can't really make solid solutions of oxygen and sulfur. Um, so if you look in the in the literature, there's there's very few examples of that. So um, if you have an oxysulfide type material, those those tend to phase separate and you get or or site separate into their own sites. So you have these like anti perovskite like structures where oxygen sits on its own site and sulfur sits on its own site. Um, and in fact, um, that makes it really difficult to understand what's going on with the anion redox. So uh, we can't do this like solid solution type thing that we did with the selenide. Um, but I agree with you, if we, if we can find a way to form stable oxysulfides as solid solutions, it would be great. Um, and we're working on that, but I don't know that we're gonna get there. I think, you know, if you look at the sulfides and the oxides, very often they're, they're not isostructural for the two end members. So it's gonna be really hard to stabilize those in a solid solution, but we have other ideas on how we might be able to do it. Yeah, I agree with you because uh, oxygen in uh, periodic table period two, my God, it's atomic uh, radius uh, compared to next one down. Uh, the, the percentage difference is so big. So it's a very, <laughs> very different <laughs> chemistry compared to sol sulfide and selenide. It, it's, yeah. it's a challenge right there, yeah. yeah um, oxides are extremely hard and sulfides are much softer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm thinking along similar line, right? So uh, you look at iron, so that's great. Iron is abundant. It has this oxidation state of two plus, three plus. Uh, is there another transition metal iron combined with sulfide other than iron sulfide and titanium sulfide? You look at, you, you, you look at these two today. Um, and other transition metal iron that might look attractive? Yeah, we have been able actually to put other metals into the Li2-FES2 phase. Um, it's not, we, we have to actually change more than just the metal to get it in. Um, and those are much less reversible than the iron phase. So we don't fully understand why that is, but I think that there's some conversion that happens when we do the oxidation that we don't get in the iron phase because we have participation of metal throughout more parts of the charge curve than we do with iron. How, how is vanadium sulfide? There are some really interesting vanadium sulfide phases. Um, we, I've actually stayed away from vanadium because vanadium is so promiscuous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but um, yeah, there are some really interesting lithium vanadium sulfur phases that, that might be interesting to look at for sure. Yeah. So just for brainstorming purpose came um, now looking at iron sulfide is so one iron two sulfur. So it's still a possibility to have something, I understand it's probably not a stable phase right there. The sulfur ratio to iron ratio go higher. Uh, for example, you have one iron, but sulfide is almost like iron sulfur two mixed up with some sulfur. Then you sulfur amount goes high, then you increase the capacity of your N iron, uh, that plot <laughs> even more <laughs> to access a milliamp per gram, much higher <laughs> capacity. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting idea. I'm not, I'm not familiar with any thermodynamic phases that have a higher stoichiometry of sulfur to iron than one to two. Um, but if you look at phases like, I mean, one, one way to think about this, I guess, would be, you know, conversion of FES2. So if you do conversion of FES2, eventually you get to S8. Yeah. Um, and, and at some points along that curve, right, you're going to have high degrees of, of sulfur, um, sulfur, sulfur bonds compared to iron. So, um, I guess that's one way to think about it, but from a thermodynamic perspective, uh, that there's, there's nothing there, um, that's, that's stable. Yeah. Okay.
Well, I think this is great. Um, I think I should uh, probably uh, invite uh, also Wolfgang back to the stage <laughs> together with Kim. We can have uh, uh, a panel discussion. Yeah, I, I want to maybe ask the first question. We'll feel free to chime in any time. Um, uh, both Wolfgang and, and Kim, two of you are you are in uh, in a relative sense, right? Uh, early career of <laughs> stage of your career, and um, anything I'll just say anything you can share with a uh, young students in postdoc, uh, in the uh, in the battery space, electrochemical energy storage space. Um, as one question we often ask to our panelists or any other wise to uh, the, the students and postdocs. Jim? <laughs> I'll let you go first. Um, I would say, I, I guess specifically in the battery space, I would say um, be wary of trends and try and do things that aren't along the lines of what everyone else is doing. Because I think that often, I don't know, I think this is probably true of a lot of fields, but I think with, with the battery field in particular, you know, we can get really focused on on like one thing and it's probably good to try and try and deviate from that sometimes and be be uh, courageous. Yeah, I would have gone along the same line. I think like it, I would have used the word volatile. <laughs> and so <laughs> do what you find fun um, and, and it'll work out. I think in a sense, both of you are uh, show examples uh, today. <laughs> yeah, of, uh, you know, yeah, I appreciate particularly this, Kim, the session I'm, I'm, I'm chairing uh, for you, right? So we are doing this beautiful fundamental study uh, on, on a system having a lot of beautiful science uh, right there. Uh, I think uh, this really, you know, the sulfide system so I suddenly open up a new understanding that's that just been great. Uh, Will, do you want to chime in? Sure, sure. Thanks, E. Um, and Kim, again, great, great talk. Um, I want to ask maybe just on a broader note as well before diving into more specifics. And, and both of you come from the solid state chemistry field. Um, you know, it's such a rich space, um, but I think the battery community has sort of focused on a you know, few important, say, crystal structures, for example. So I'm curious in, in sort of looking forward, um, what are some of the new, really cool solid state chemistry concepts that you think we can learn from, say, materials for batteries? So uh, something I'm really excited about are these anionic solid solutions. I think Wolfgang is too. I think there's sort of a, you know, I don't, I don't know, maybe this is wrong because I haven't been around very long, but it feels like most of the solid solutions, you know, we're looking at cationic solid solutions and there's a lot of good reasons to do that. Um, but I think there's sort of untapped potential in these anionic solid solutions. And we're, we're really learning a lot by doing that. And I think not only from charge compensation point of view, but like what Wolfgang showed and and looking at the, the sulfide versus the selenium, the selenide um, materials and how that can affect these lattice dynamics, I think is also very cool. Yeah, I, I, would, I would add on to that because what I think in, along those lines, we need to, one really needs to think about local structure of materials because when we're saying, or we're, we're making these solid solutions, what you're really doing is, at least in our case, you have a PS4 unit and you substitute the sulfur with a selenium. Um, you're actually creating a variety of polyhedral species. You get then PS3, SE1, PS2, SE2, PS1, SE3. So you get really a, a nice, in terms of Rama, it looks like a Bernoulli distribution of, um, of uh, tetrahedral symmetry, C3V and C2V uh, symmetry uh, polyhedra that are clearly somehow distributed through a material. And so whenever one, one just thinks of, oh, it's a solid solution from an, from an anion, this locally means that you have all sorts of different polyhedra that will have locally entirely different effects. And so for one, one needs to understand this from a local structure and then figure out 
can we even average over things? Like we're, we're I think as, 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 as structural chemists, we're automatically averaging over everything. Um, the way we're doing our like the fractal fraction is, is, is really just the global average, but is this enough? And um, this is something that I, that I find quite exciting these days actually. So Wolfgang and Kim, I couldn't agree more. In fact, that was one of the questions I was gonna ask next is, you know, I, 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 I trained in the point defect chemistry community. So we also think in terms of average, right? So you put all the defects in and then it has an average transport property or average thermodynamic property. But fully agree with the both of you that these are modifying the local structure wherever the defect sits and you show beautifully for substitutions or for uh, point defect like vacancies. Um, and this distribution of local structure really makes it confusing um, to establish, you know, Wolfgang, what you said about descriptors, or Kim, your, your efforts to understand the redox potential, for example, because it's really hard to know exactly what, which one of those local motifs are really um, responsible. So, I, and I think from an experimental perspective, and perhaps it's easier in theoretical approaches, but experimentally, this is also quite challenging. Um, so I was wondering if the both of you can comment briefly on, you know, what are the next steps as we go from this more of an average structure perspective into a local structure perspective? Um, what are the technical breakthroughs that we need in order to really think about these things more as a collection or ensemble of local structure, as opposed to averaging them and taking them in, as Wolfgang pointed out? Uh, Kim? Um, I think, you know, of course, we have our local structural probes like PDF and XFs, which XFs isn't, you know, XFs you're still averaging. So, you know, you really need something like PDF, um, which are, are good tools. And, and you can have also other local structural probes like NMR can actually be a good reporter on local structure. Um, but, but it's hard to measure. So one thing we've been doing um, in, and sort of actually in the context of anion redox is installing um, very diluted reporters into the material so that you can say, okay, I can, you know, just look at that reporter and that will tell me what's locally around it. And because it's so dilute, I can assume that I can see the local structure around that reporter. Um, so that's something that we're sort of trying to do, but it's, it's hard. <laughs> It's really hard. Um, but I, yeah, I, I agree that it's incredibly important to understand where defects are. I mean, what we've seen, especially, you know, in, in especially in these, like these, these lithium rich materials, you have multiple locations where you can form a vacancy. Like we, we don't even really know where the lithium is coming from. Um, and, and that's hard to figure out, right? <laughs> so I think Kim, it's even more complicated, right? Because even if we look at these local structures and the defects, or let's say, maybe vacancy clustering, all of these classic, classic things that we know is this is out of the experiment. We don't know how any of these things behave once there's an applied potential, right? When, when there's actually things moving around, um, maybe averaging is good enough. Um, so I think in principle, one would have to, not just at the local structure, but also under load and uh, yeah. while doing some things, a really operando. And, um, yeah. This is difficult to really map out an ion jumping and then locally resolving what it's doing with the structure. Um, maybe with like, I mean, free electron lasers are coming up more and more. So you have much faster time scales. Maybe one can sort of design electrochemical experiments while using a free electron laser. Um, PDF is probably still averaging too much over it. Uh, TEM would be nice. In our case, the TEM just shoots away um, your sulfur and your TEM collaborators don't like you anymore because they have sulfur <laughs> all over the place in the chamber. Um, well, one so thing I, think... I, was good, I was going to say TEM, but uh, exactly <laughs> the beam damage is uh, yeah. uh, in the blando condition is challenging. And then right. but you can do cryo low dose imaging or direct electron detector, but once it's cryo, Nothing will be moving anymore. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah. it's a, it's a challenging, yeah, problem. But I think this is this is something that just because it's challenging now doesn't mean that we can't solve it and uh, are able to do this routinely in, in thirty years. I mean, now look, there's there's lab PDF diffractometer, there's lab XFs. Back then, you needed to go to a beamline. You don't need that necessarily anymore. So there's a lot of things that 
um, hopefully in, in 20 years are not too problematic anymore. And so we just need to figure out how to get there. We just need more money. <laughs> Wolfgang, this is such a great uh, vision you're painting because, um, you know, 20 years ago, operando, anything wasn't really a thing. And now it is routine, right? So I think in 20 more years, and certainly things we don't think is possible, will also become routine. Uh, yeah, I think we're all children that just have expensive toys and maybe in 20 years, these, uh, there's new toys. <laughs> well, hopefully the price will have come down. They're not asking. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Uh, e, back to you. Yeah, I, I want to ask uh, both of you, you know, we have seen the um, explosion of lithium ion to the, in the market uh, space. Um, and uh, that brings the challenge of uh, outline and some of your, um, I think, slides is we need to look for really abundant elements. Uh, we need to look for the features that uh, can get us to go beyond lithium ion. But lithium ion will still be there, you know, <laughs> for extremely long time. Um, what would be the type of uh, chemistry? You know, does the solid state enable, you know, NO, a different NO in cathode chemistry? And Kim, you are looking into N ion. But, uh, you know, look down to the past, can matching and go beyond the lithium ion, both performance and the cost, what, what might be the one, right, there for us to, to, to think about? I know, Kim, you, you look at, you know, sulfur anion redox. Is the sulfur anion redox the, the one uh, continue down to the path? Wolfgang, your, your solid state, right, right there. Like, what, what will be the system if it's for solid state? What will be the electrolyte? This still oxide right there, this all type of sulfide family uh, availability. But uh, if we use uh, lithium ion as the, the reference right there, what could be the, the one we should uh, look into more? You go first. I know it's a hard question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a question that I ask myself every day. <laughs> I don't have the answer, that's why I ask you. <laughs> not, not to increase the stakes, you're also, you know, on, on video and on record. <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe um, then, then I'll, ha I'll, I'll start with the easy answers and I give the hard ones to Kim uh, since we're on record. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think for one, sodium is very attractive. From an abundance perspective, um, uh, there's a lot of the challenges that people said we're talking about five years ago with in terms of sodium uh, ion batteries um they're sort of slowly being mitigated i think catl is now trying to put those into the packs together with lithium ion um sodium solid state batteries work not well yet but they might get there um going away from lithium so my my typical answer answer of lithium sulfur solid state batteries that won't work um, there's, there's fluoride ion batteries and there's fluoride ion solid state batteries, but you know what, maybe in 30 years, we just need to go back to the oxide ion that is moving around because that is very abundant and that would just bring us to fuel cells. <laughs> Well, uh, okay. I think that's a fail, you know, uh, speculation. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be a little, I guess, a little more political about this. <laughs> so I think it depends on the application. I think, I think, you know, of course, the application will define the, the energy density metrics and the cost metrics that you need. So it makes sense to me to, for us to pursue a variety of different chemistries because we're going to need a variety of different types of batteries for the applications that we want to use them in. Um, so I think, you know, I, like you said, E, I don't think we're ever going to replace lithium ion. But what we need to be able to do is be able to uh, not use lithium ion in applications where we can use something else. I think that's um, really important. So, so that's why we've we've been really interested in these multivalent ions. I think that I think that the the, the hope of using metal multivalent um, type batteries with metal anodes is is really exciting. But I also think using sulfur. I think there is a future for sulfur, whether it's elemental sulfur or sulfides um i'm not sure but uh i think there's there's a lot of interesting things to do there <laughs>
So Kim, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask a question because I always get, when I say, well, sulfur, there's more than enough sulfur uh, in the world to use. Uh, I usually get the answer, well, you know, the most of the sulfur comes from the oil that we're pulling out of the earth, right? If we don't do that anymore, then where do we get all that sulfur from? Um, are we then just uh, drilling for oil to get sulfur or? <laughs> I, well, one, I think that there's plenty of, of sulfur from oil refining. <laughs> uh, and, and two is that um, if we do run out of that, then good for us. And we can start looking in volcanoes. <laughs> uh, so if you've seen, I mean, you've seen these images. I, I don't actually know um, the, the reserve numbers in volcanic areas. But like in Indonesia, you can walk into a volcano with a shovel and come out with chunks of sulfur. And it's very bad for you. You should not do that because there's lots of H2S. But um, that's people do that. To... So, so Wolfgang, even though we don't uh, uh, burn oil, but we still need plastic. So uh, this will come from uh, very likely for oil. <laughs> We're still pulling out salt. We still have salt coming from there. Yeah. <laughs> Can I also add my predictions? <laughs> yeah, please. So it's just like uh, everyone said, you know, lithium ion for sure will be here for a long, long time. And just because the, the, the industry is just above critical mass uh, in unprecedented ways. But, you know, I do think if I look at the history, of lithium ion. Why did lithium ion emerge? It was really because the aqueous chemistry, electrochemistry didn't deliver the voltage that was needed. And, and that was the step jump that was really essential. But I think if we look at it, a lot of the challenges with lithium ion also come from its voltages, uh, safety, electrolyte compatibility. And I think you show beautifully, when you go down in voltage, a lot of interesting things can happen. So my prediction, maybe in the 20 year horizon is I think we're gonna see maybe a shift back to aqueous um, electrochemistry for energy storage. And there will be a more emphasis uh, like what Kim you're doing is to just increase the capacity more. Um, you know, we didn't really have the tricks 20 years ago when the research for nickel metal hydro battery stopped uh, that we have today for lithium ion. But some of those, I think principles can be applied much more easily when you're at the one volt range. And I think manufacturability uh, will definitely be a big topic. Sustainability will be a big topic. You know, you don't have to work with NMP, that's going to be an advantage. So I think a lot of these um, price that we pay for lithium ion will become higher and higher. And that may shift the balance back to aqueous, um, which I think would be kind of a cyclic thing, would be kind of fun to watch. Uh, to see if that was really the case. Yeah, well, well, well that, that's a great point. Um, probably aqueous for, uh, I think what you mean is for uh, stationary, more for stationary storage instead of uh, portable. I, I think it's possible that if we can make the advancement needed on the, uh, on the, end, on the capacity side, and there may be a pathway to getting a closer. It probably will be never as good as lithium ion because 3X is just really hard to get in capacity but maybe 2X is possible. And then you can be sort of at the levels of lithium iron phosphate. Um, but I think the safety and manufacturability trade-offs will become increasingly more important even for transportation batteries, I think. I mean, LA, already li 2 fes 2 is, is competitive with definitely LFP for sure. And um, I think the question in my mind is balance of plant though. So as you go to these lower voltage materials, you have to stack more, right? So it's kind of a question of how much that affects your energy density on the pack scale. Um, and it's, it's not clear to me what, what's gonna happen there because we don't, we don't really know what that material is gonna be. So, so I actually came to that point. Uh, we have a very interesting session coming up in a, in a few weeks where um, we will have a two speaker talking about cell to pack technology. Um, and this is uh, um, um, looking basically at the volumetric utilization on the pack level. And I think most people agree that the safer the battery, the lower the voltage, the more you can pack. So we also had uh, Nicola Campignon from uh, McKinsey talk a few weeks ago, uh, uh, about a month and a half ago. And he basically told us that the state of the art, um, you know, NMC 622 battery in China at the pack level uh, is only a few percent more energy dense than the state of the art LFP battery, um, just because you can pack more densely. So I think, like you mentioned, completely agree that the system level consideration may be paramount uh, because at the end of the day for transportation is the pack that matters, not, not the individual cathodes chemistry.
Well, I probably should let you uh, conclude today's session. Sure. Um, do either of you want to um, say like a one minute thing to um, finish us up today? Parting words. Go ahead, Wolfgang. Parting words. Well, I would like to being in, being in California right now to parting words. No, um, I think fr from a science perspective, um, and and this is something that Kim already said. There's there's always these trends and and will also point it out i think a lot of things do come in waves and uh in the end i don't think it's really the question of which system will survive it's we need to get better on the fundamental understanding and then like sort of push this into an application and um i think in the end there's just a lot more to do over the next uh time of our career at least and, and i think that's what's exciting yeah, I would definitely echo that sentiment. And I think on top of that, I think there's a lot of interesting reasons to look at new chemistries, um, which is really exciting from a fundamental point of view, which is what we all love to do, I think, um, and really understand why things work or why they don't work. But it's also really exciting to think about what the future of battery chemistries might be, because there are so many different options. Um, so that's, it's, it's a very cool time to, to be um, working in this field, I think, because we can start to shape what, what the future might look like. Well, Wolfgang and Kim, thank you so much. On, uh, and on those note, I'm, um, let's go ahead and close up the session today. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, in two weeks, we will have uh, Professor Chao Yong Wang from Penn State to talk about cell-to-pack technology in the context of thermal regulation at the battery pack level. And we're also delighted to uh, host uh, Mujib uh, Ijaz, uh, the CEO of um, ONE, and they're developing uh, cell to pack technology. So uh, it is quite different than the talk today, but uh, I think this is the fun part of StorageX seminars that we're really going from atoms to systems. So I'd like to thank everyone again for tuning in. Uh, Kim Wolfgang, uh, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, and I look forward to seeing everyone in, in two weeks. Thank you.